San Bonani Dumelang, we met up. Good afternoon. It's okay, in my culture, we greet back. It's okay. <laughs> I know I had to get my passport stamped on my way to, from Cape Town to Hermanus. <laughs> so I must say up front, this is a long walk to freedom. But it's good to be here. Thank you, Alec and the team. I think Biz News are a phenomenal institution for our politics. And it's important that you have institutions that are able to help leaders like myself be held accountable, but South Africans like you to be informed. And so it's my privilege today to be able to speak to you and to speak at this particular conference. And I want to uh, publicly acknowledge the leaders of political parties that are here today. I have the difficult job of standing between you and a gin and tonic. So if you ask me nice questions, we'll keep them brief and make sure gin and tonic arrives, or we'll be here for the afternoon. Many of you would know I grew up in Soweto. Some of my life I spent in parliamentary politics. Much of it I spent in church, and then some of it I spent in business. And often we can speak about I have a, I'm completing a PhD in economics as we speak. But I want to speak to you a little bit about something that I hold dear, maybe draw inspiration from the Bible. You know, it's a fascinating thing when you read about the story of the Israelites in many ways leaving Egypt on their way to the promised land. And I think South Africa has some parallels to this issue. You have great leaders like Nelson Mandela who are able to lead a nation from Egypt, and maybe they themselves don't get them into the promised land. But I pause at a point where Moses' successor sends a number of people to go spy the land. Upon arriving, they come back with mixed reports. If you've ever read the Bible in Numbers, it tells a story about how some of the spies came back and argued that there are too many difficulties in this land. There are too many giants. We will get annihilated. And then there are some who come back and say, we see a land flowing with milk and honey. The conflict in South Africa is, as others have said it, it's a country where almost the worst never happens, but the best is too far to reach. It's a land of contradictions where there are some incredible things that happen and some difficult things that take place. The temptation for the spies is to long for going backwards. And I sometimes find much of our political debate so littered with what yesterday means. We debate our history, whether it's that of colonialism, apartheid, or the last 30 years. So when you come and you speak, in an election year, it could also be tempting to reduce this election about political battles that have taken place intra-party. What happens between Jacob Zuma and Cyril Ramaphosa? Others would come here today and ask the question, what is going on between you and John? But as Jan Smart said, You've got to, when confronted with difficult choices, take the courageous one. And I am here to say to you, it would have been tempting for me to come and tell you about the giants in our land. But I want to choose a different path today. I want to talk about a tomorrow we can all have and speak about the opportunities that this great country presents. Because whether you might be on the Facebook group that says you are staying or not staying, but I dare believe that you are here at this conference because you genuinely believe that this country can be great and that we can prosper and that we see a different outcome for our future and the future of our kids. And so if you are with me on that path, I want to take you on a journey because when you reflect on history, whether it's that of colonialism or whether it's that of apartheid, we've come through it 
because of leaders who are able to see beyond their circumstances. It's leaders like Martin Luther King, who in his final address, hours before he got murdered, he said these incredible words. It doesn't matter to me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight that we as a people will get to the promised land. Fellow South Africans, those powerful words are words echoed in time and time and again by leaders who are able to see beyond. I don't want to come and speak to you about the 29th of May only, but I want to speak to you about what happens in 2029 and what my Kalaleto, who is 13 years today and will be voting at the next elections after that, and my little kids and your kids, what can they inherit in this country? Because if we can agree on the long-term story, we can hopefully find solutions that immediately confront us. The error we could make is to be transactional and simply come together for this short-term moment of changing a government and fail the difficult duty of being able to say what future do we want for our kids and your kids. Nelson Mandela is one such who in his famous speech said, what we are demanding is equal political right because without them, our disabilities become permanent. He says this, he says this makes the white men fear democracy. But this fear cannot be allowed to stand in the way of the only solution which will guarantee racial harmony and freedom for all. It is not true that the enfranchisement of all will result in racial domination. This was Nelson Mandela speaking in 1964, or at least, sorry, at the Ravonia trial. He understood that actually, even though decades would come before everyone could vote, but he had a vision beyond just that moment. He understood this truth, that political division based on color is entirely artificial, and when it disappears, so will the domination of one color group by another. I say this because part of me laments when I look at the ballot. When I look at even the ballot in 2024, it can be tempting to see black parties, white parties, Indian parties, colored parties, Zulu parties, re regional parties, or re religious parties. I dare to believe, and that's why in many ways, when I walked out the doors of parliament in 2019, I vowed that day to start a political movement upon which all men and all women would stand within that party, not united by the color of their skin or the God they worship, but rather by the ideals they hold for the future so that it can be that one day black people and white people will be able to prosper together in our beautiful country. That's the dream. And that's what I wake up to every single day. And that's why when we say build one South Africa, we don't just make that a case as though it's a nice phrase. We make it because I genuinely think that we must reject straight-jacketed politics and truly enter into a world where we could see a difference. I believe we can reset this country. I believe we can do so when we can enter the ballot expressing ideals. Because as one political analyst once said, otherwise demography becomes destiny. Otherwise, we may as well take the census, look at whose race is where, and then allocate votes that way. I dare believe things can be different. Mandela closes his address with words I'm sure all of us have heard so many times. I fought against white domination and I fought against black domination. I've cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunity. It is indeed an ideal which I hope to live for and to achieve. But if needs be, it is an ideal to which I'm willing to die. Fellow South Africans, I think this moment requires of us to look again at our future. To vote for leaders who can think about a long-term tomorrow. Conrad Adenauer the German chancellor 
speaks so eloquently about the fact that when we enter the political world, the role of the president isn't just to administer, but is to figure out the story of the nation and add the next chapter to it. Whoever we elect on the 29th of May to be the president is not just putting together the tools of the car as if all we need is a mechanic, but it's someone who can tell us where that vehicle called South Africa is going. I agonized, Alec, about this address because I thought it would have been tempting to come here and compare, jostle, speak about others, or even tell you how fraught the ANC is. I dare think all of you know that. I want to choose a different tomorrow. The topic was how to rebuild South Africa post the ANC. I dare say it must begin with a vision. It must begin with that vision that says we are united on our values. The starting point must be at least that we acknowledge two values, enshrined one in our constitution, the nation of Ubuntu. The ideal that says I see you because you're a fellow human being before I see any other thing. That we share common threats. Because if I don't own that value, then what basis do I have to fight against racism? or fight against classism, or whatever ism you want to put on the table until I see that a fellow human being shares common threats. The second is the idea of justice. That actually our past is too painful to ignore. And I want to say this, and you may, you may reject everything I say, but here's a simple truth. Until South Africa recognizes that the threat that sits in a township and the threat that sits on the farm and the threat that sits in any other suburb is a shared threat for all of us that we must confront our challenges together. There shall be no peace and there should be no peace. I dare say, let us indeed prosper together. So what do I see? Along with values, I want to make this case that indeed South Africa can prosper for all that black and white, and by that I mean colored Indian and all South Africans, that we are all descendants of this great nation, that we recognize this, that we're endowed with such great assets, and with those it's not just our minerals, our beauty, our people, but I see a nation where an economy can grow, and I can dare say, if we work collectively together as a people, because I know the question is going to be about coalitions, but it's not just a coalition of political parties. It's a coalition with business, civil society, so that we can deliver an economy that grows at higher than 3% and ultimately can put 2 million jobs in this country so that every household has at least one person that is working in that house. That's the motif. We have to build a nation where young people start school and finish school. 40% of our youth drop out. I reject that. We have to be kind and look after the child in the womb as much as we do the child out the womb. And that means that for mothers who cannot feed their kids, I dare say we need to introduce a form of maternal grant that will make sure our kids are able to grow up healthy from the womb. Or otherwise our kids are growing up stunted. I dare dream of a nation where our young people can learn robotics, they can learn science, so that they can compete not only with days in their neighborhoods, but with anyone else in the world. I'll never forget this. I once went to Amsterdam, and I was shocked that in the middle of the night, I saw a woman cycling through the streets. I thought, what kind of country is this, where women can feel so free? but it reminded me of how abnormal our crime is in this country. And therefore, if we are to fix, we must ensure that women can, women and South Africans can feel safe. That the, scala, the, the, the color of your skin does not determine your trajectory, but in fact, your character does. That where we live in a country where our leaders are ethical, that public service is restored, a nation where our healthcare ensures that at a basic level, a mother can take her child to the clinic, I dare say 
It must be a land where each one can have a place they called home, where they can have a piece of land that they can grow in, to call home, to farm, and to manufacture for. I dare say we must be a nation at peace with ourselves, with Africa and the world. To achieve that, we have a lot of work to do. And I'm here to propose that actually there are 10 things we've got to do if we're going to achieve. The first is, without doubt, you have to keep the lights on. It's difficult to grow any economy in the dark. And that's why I've worked so hard. I was in Sweden a number of years ago and engaged a number of engineers about SMRs and how we can introduce those as a way to create a sensible base load. Along with building digital infrastructure, we have to make sure everyone is a citizen of the internet at a cost they can all afford. Because if citizens are not digital citizens, they're being left out and being left in an industrial economy rather than an information economy. We have to fix Transnet. And I put these plans before you because it's the only basis upon which we can have a coalition. We can't just coalesce to remove the NC. We must coalesce around the plan. The transporting of people and the transporting of goods must be important to all of us. 40% of income earned by South Africans is spent on public transport. That's the South Africa where people are spending too much money getting to work. We must transform our ICT sector and have a vision. I met yesterday with a number of telcos in this country, and too many of them lament the fact that the last review of our ICT sector only took place in 2008. That would be like using a computer from 2008 and hoping it will solve today's problems. We must review it so that our kids can do robotics and can participate in the economy of the future. Alec, you are from Joburg as am I. The joke now in Johannesburg is that you can either have water or electricity or internet, but not all three at the same time. Often when I speak to my family, my question to them is, when last did you bar? What dignity is in that? We're seeing the bickering of parties in Joburg when citizens cannot bar. I dare argue that let's not judge all coalitions in what's going on in Joburg. Let's realize that coalitions work and let's realize that Cape Town would have never had a new government until that seven party coalition came on board. I've consulted with the Public Service Commission to create a strict guidelines to build state capability and appoint the right people into administration. We have to decentralize the police we will never fight crime so long as police are a national competence and don't have priorities. The priority must be murder and intelligence must be lowered down in communities. Because what's the point of being stopped by Metro Police all for them to check whether my license disc was, was paid up to date or not, rather than fighting criminals who are killing citizens? And I would dare say we long overdue a new Minister of Police. <laughs> Along with that, if our kids are not educated, they are not only going to be unemployed, but they are unemployable. And so I've suggested that we give vouchers to parents for them to choose where they want their kids to go to school for them to be able to say, if this school is useless, I have the money, the means to add a little bit of my income to choose where my child can go to school. I celebrate what Herman speaks about infrastructure because without roads, without bridges, our construction sector having collapsed, South Africa's economy cannot work for the future. We must change the regulatory framework, especially around SOEs to make it easier 
for people to be able to create economic prosperity, for us to be globally competitive. We must keep a workforce healthy, and therefore I reject this idea of this current NHI bill, but I think there is a way of finding universal health care that works. Lastly, when I left Parliament, I went to the Electoral Court, or to the Constitutional Court, and there was a significant case that was won to amend the Electoral Act. It gave Parliament the duty to change how its leaders are elected. Because we are suffering today because those on state capture can end up back on their party's list and back to Parliament. Imagine if we had a constituency-based model that allowed us to choose our leaders, that allowed us to know that when there's no water, no schooling, no electricity, there's a member of Parliament who must come and answer the question. We have to ensure that we amend the Electoral Act further. I close just with these thoughts. If you have a credible dream, if you have a capable state, we have to make sure in these elections we elect leaders who can take us forward. Don't let anyone see a manga around coalitions. I hear the president saying that it's a regime change. What nonsense is that? It's not. It's democracy. It's the opportunity to bring change. And therefore, what I'm calling for is that as we come together, I worked hard from 2016 to 2019 when Herman was mayor in Joburg to help manage the coalitions and ensure that he kept in office. On some days it required phone calls late at night. But the starting point, fellow South Africans, is that let's get leaders who are credible. Let's get leaders who can be able to speak around the table and build a credible coalition. And let's not sear coalitions. No one is going to get an outright majority in these elections. But what we need are parties that can stand in the middle with credible leaders from communities. What Alec was saying that I've been to communities, I've identified some of the best, brightest, young South Africans to stand in parliament who hate had to get nomination from their communities. They're not politicians. They're leaders in their rights. Some from business, some from civil society. And I'm bringing them together with the most diverse caucus so that they can hold that middle ground. This year is historic not because South Africa alone goes to elections. It's that over 64 countries go to elections. And if all of them participate, and if all of them get an election result, here's the threat. 31% of the countries will elect dictators, and parties that are winning and can create a majority are centrist parties who are able to bring all citizens of their respective countries together. So yes, it's going to be hard, but we have to get it right. I've said to people, this election is about 2 million votes. It's some votes that sit in the middle. I don't buy half of this polling that's on the table because I think it was done in some ways. It's getting surprised. MK is coming out. We don't know what the electricity is going to do. All I know is that as citizens are starting to think hard, they are wanting to back leaders they can trust and leaders they can work with. So of the 27 million South Africans who are registered, all I'm simply asking for them is 2 million, because it's the 2 million that will determine the trajectory of this, of this country. If those 2 millions go to the EFF, those values will be cultivated in society. If those 2 million go to parties like BOSA or us, it's the values of non-racialism, Ubuntu, justice, capability of the state, raising of education that can work to go forward. I dare say we have our biggest opportunity now, and we have to show it. I've worked in the last while to show when people are open in rural communities where there's no water and you put a borehole, suddenly you are the government in working, not a government in waiting, because you can bring about that change. So yes, I take maybe lead from so many leaders, Helen Sussman, so many, but I want to close maybe with this. As President Mbeki said in his I am an African speech, he said, whatever the setbacks of this moment, nothing can stop us now. Whatever the difficulties, Africa shall be at peace. However improbable it may sound to the skeptics, Africa will prosper. And if we're going to make it, this is the election, not to vote for old, but to vote for new not to face up to our fears, 
but to hold on to our hopes because tomorrow will be better than yesterday. I thank you very much. <laughs>